Chapter 1. Brutalization begets brutalization. Violence begets violence. In Santa Fe, we had a system of penology with the mentality that all was punishment. When you take everything away from a human being, including his personal dignity, he has nothing left to lose. He becomes extremely dangerous. Dr. John Salazar, former Secretary of Corrections, State of New Mexico. Friday, February 1st, 1980. There was a full moon that Friday night. I watched it move across the patch of sky framed by the window near my bunk, noticing how it turned the desert surrounding the penitentiary ghost white. I even thought about all the superstitions connected with the full moon and something I'd read recently about a survey proving that crime really did increase every month when the full moon was full. I was tuned in, but not enough. It didn't cross my mind that the instigators of a long planned riot would choose this night to put their scheme into action. Maybe that's because I didn't really think of a prison uprising as something criminal. To me, it was a righteous and overdue response to years of abuse, mental and physical. All that overdue rage, though, made people go crazier than anyone expected. 11.45 p.m. Eight well-juiced inmates sat around the table in the day room of dormitory E2. Since just after 8.30, evening headcount, they've been chugging down a new batch of homebrew, prison booze made of fermented raisins, yeast, sugar, and water. Angry and loud, they were bitching about conditions. Unless something's done soon, the man's gonna have all the white boys locked down in three. Over half the brotherhood's in there already, a ranking member of the Aryan Brotherhood told the group. Most of the Anglo population, a minority in this Chicano dominated prison, belong to his clique. It ain't just you guys. There's a lot of homeboys locked up right now too, said a lieutenant of the Chicano clique. There was occasional racial tension between the Anglos, the name given to the whites in New Mexico, and Chicanos, but usually the two groups maintained a truce and banded together to fight the blacks, none of whom lived in this dormitory. So what are we gonna do about it? Another broke in. We've been talking about a riot for so long now, I'm fucking tired of waiting. Okay, what about tonight? The eight men sat stunned for a moment, then nodding in agreement, grins spread across their faces. Well, all right, that's what I wanted to hear. They poured another round of brew, toasted their decision, and began discussing the details of the takeover. A Chicano leader spoke for his clique. If we can pull it off, we can count on at least 300 of our people to back our play. How many white brothers can we count on? At least 150, maybe more. If we can take cell block three, there's another 60 in there. I don't trust the blacks. What do you guys think? They're either with us or against us. If they won't go along, we'll fuck them up. But I think they will. They're as tired of the man's actions as we are. In fact, I don't think we're gonna have any trouble getting the majority of the population to go along with us. Okay, let's get the show on the road then. We'll take them when they come in for the 130 count like we planned. I'll call the white bros here. You go get your guys, the Aryan told the Chicanos at the table. If anyone's asleep, wake the fucker up. Less than 10 minutes later, all 62 residents of dormitory E2 were crowded into the day room, the area usually used for TV and car games. These inmates had also been drinking and were psyched for the instructions being circulated in hushed voices. When the pigs come in tonight to take count, we're gonna grab them and take over this prison. Here's how it's going down. When the two screws who are counting get to the back of the dorm, three of us will grab them. Two of us will take the pigs at the door, which will be easy since these assholes never lock it like they're supposed to. <laughs> Look asleep when they come in, but be ready to cover our action when we need you. Anyone who stays in the sack after the shit hits is in trouble. 1.30 a.m. Saturday, February 2nd, 1980. Shift Captain Gregory Royball and Corrections Officers Michael Schmidt and Ronnie Martinez arrived at E2 to close down the day room and take the final count for the night. Officer Martinez opened the dormitory door and Royball and Schmidt walked into the unit. Officer Martinez waited outside. Just as Martinez was closing the door, Lieutenant Jose Anaya unexpectedly arrived. 
he'd received word that there had been drinking going on earlier and decided to come down to back up his fellow officers in case trouble was brewing. Big mistake, fucker. He followed Captain Royball and Officer Schmidt inside E2. Officer Martinez, as anticipated, did not lock the door behind them, but left it ajar. Two of the riot planners were lying in wait on bunks by the door, and two others were on end bunks by the day room. All the planners had made homemade shanks, knives, within easy reach under pillows or blankets. When they saw there were three guards instead of the anticipated two, they felt only a moment of panic before one of them whispered to the man in the next bed, pass it on, everyone jumps when we make our move, get ready. They let Schmidt make it to the day room, lock the door and turn off the dormitory lights. The leaders knew this would be to their advantage. The only illumination in the place would then come from the bathroom. The blue night lights used from lockup to daybreak were out of order. Those lights had been out of order for over a month. Though a guard had written a memo requesting they be fixed for security reasons. Rumors of a riot had reached the administration's ears back in mid-January and its promoters were known to be in E2. Since then, the officers were more tense than usual when taking final headcount in that unit. Even if a riot had not been in the wind, corrections officers would have had reason to be wary. E2 was minimum security unit, but just before Thanksgiving, it was filled with the most hardcore convicts in the penitentiary. They'd been transferred from cell block five, where the violent, escape-prone, high security risk inmates were permanently housed. So that renovations could be made in that cell block. It must have been eerie for the guards to walk down the long aisles dark with those blue lights, especially because the unit was a minefield of double bunks jutting out from both walls and single beds taking up two rows in the center. They knew how easy it would be for an inmate to hide behind one of the double bunks and jump them. When Schmidt came out of the day room, Captain Roy Ball was halfway down the aisle and Lieutenant Anaya was four or five bunks in. At that moment, all their fears came true. One of the inmates in front sprang from his bed and pushed open the front door while another lunged at Officer Martinez outside, who was struggling to force the door shut. Two men in the back of the dormitory took on Schmidt, and groups in the middle seized Captain Royball and Lieutenant Anaya. It's going down now. They were all easily overpowered. Captain Royball and Lieutenant Anaya were both 50 years old, short and not particularly physically fit. The convicts were younger and quicker, and most of them spent a lot of time lifting weights. Only Officer Schmidt had the youth and size to be a challenge, but the sheer number of his opposition brought him down. The four guards were dragged into the day room, stripped naked, their ankles bound with torn bed sheets, and their hands tied behind their backs. Blindfold them too, someone yelled, fastening a canteen issue bandana tightly around one of the hostages' eyes. Let's keep these sorry motherfuckers shitting in their pants. They won't be able to see nothing. They won't be able to protect themselves. It'll be just like sitting in the goddamn hole. Hey, pig face. Just all those times you wrote up tickets on me and sent me into the black piss hole in the basement. Well, it's your turn now, cocksucker. Using this long imagined opportunity to pay back the man, the inmates took turns kicking, punching, spitting, stomping, even pissing on each of the guards, <laughs> taunting them with obscenities and threats on their lives and their families. While these beatings were in progress, one of the riot leaders put on Captain Royball's uniform and, with about 10 minutes, went to find the other four officers they knew were working the south side of the penitentiary. Everyone in this group had a weapon of some kind, pipes or shafts smuggled from various prison shops, then stashed in one of the many ingenious hiding places convicts managed to contrive during their abundant idle time. They went downstairs, E2 is a second floor unit, pushed open the unlocked riot control grill and stealthily walked the main corridor until they reached the two main dormitories, which were opposite of each other. Seeing no guards in them, they headed upstairs to the top tiers and found what they were after. Officers Elton Bigfoot Curry, Juan Bustos, Victor Gallegos, and Herman Gallegos 
these two were not related, had just locked down A2 and were about to enter the dormitory across the hall when the weapon-wielding band of rioters came up from behind and grabbed them. Bustos and Victor Gallegos were easily overpowered, but Curry, nicknamed Bigfoot for his size, put up a fight, knocking down several inmates before someone stabbed him in the ribs and back. The convicts now had three of these guards under their control. The fourth, Herman Gallegos, had managed to run into the dormitory day room. In the hurry to secure their captives, the rioters didn't go after the officer, but counted on the residents of the unit to take care of them. They did, but not in the way the rioters expected. Gallegos was lucky enough to find some sympathetic inmates who hid him for the duration of the uprising. <laughs> Damn. The inmates brought the new hostages down to the E2 day room, where they stripped, bound, and blindfolded them as they had the first four guards, then threw them into the middle of the room. It was these seven guards who suffered the most at the hands of the rioters. They were the first captured and the first target of the population's exploding rage. When the convicts looked at their old oppressors lying there naked and helpless, some of them crying in fear, the memories of the maltreatment these screws had forced on them flashed through their minds. <laughs> they called these motherfuckers screws back there. Not every one of the seven had been overly abusive in carrying out his duties, but three of them had. One specialized in finding subtle ways to play with the man's mind. A favorite stunt was to hold back an inmate's mail for a couple of hours. Before he'd deliver it, he'd read it and then come down to tell the dude what was in the letter. This would infuriate the con, especially when it was from his old lady and was filled with personal sentiments that gave him comfort when read privately, but sounded embarrassingly asinine coming out of the guard's snide mouth. This officer was also part of the administration's goon squad. That group called upon to beat an unruly inmate into submission before he was thrown into the hole. This was also the main gripe against the other two. Many of the hardcore inmates in this group of rioters could remember days of pain in their lower back caused by the billy clubs of these three guards. They'd never forget being taken to the hole, hands cuffed to the bars behind them while they were throttled in the kidneys. That's how the goon squad worked, by hitting the, in the kidneys and back so no marks would show. These were the guards that were sodomized. <laughs> Using their cocks like weapons, the rioters paid back the man with the worst humiliation they knew. They did it in trains, four or five inmates lining up in front of each of the three guards, ejaculating quickly, oh man, as if their semen were bullets. They worked up to such a frenzy that eventually their cocks wouldn't do. They had to take a two foot billy club, grease it down only because they tried it dry and couldn't get it in and shove it as high as they could up one's guard's ass. But they didn't kill them. Dead guards don't talk about the horrors of payback. They wanted these guards to live with what they had been done to them. They wanted to inflict the same kind of suffering the officers had inflicted on them, the kind that inmates live with day by day. And they had the sense to remember that live hostages gave them bargaining power. When this orgy wound down, the riot leader wearing the captain's uniform went with a few inmates to unlock the other dormitories on the south side, which was now in their control. Using the keys taken from the captured guards, the men unlocked the grills on both tiers of each unit, announcing as they entered, okay, loosen up, this is a riot. The white bros and Chicanos from E2 have taken all the screws on this end of the joint hostage. We're gonna take the rest of the place too. We're in charge now, not the pigs, so let's go. Within 15 minutes, some 500 inmates were turned loose on the south side of the penitentiary. They armed themselves with legs broken off of metal tables and beds, knives, razors, broken jars, locks, strung on belts, anything they could use as weapons, tearing the dormitories apart in the process. Only two units on that side were still filled with inmates. One of these was dormitory D for which the captured guards had no keys. The other was E1, a semi-protection unit for younger men whom convicts had tried to rape. 
These men turned down the freedom the riot offered and instead barricaded themselves in the dormitory with chairs, tables, and beds rammed against the steel door. They had the right idea. The beatings the first seven guards took would seem humane compared to the sadism the rioters would act out in the next 36 hours. This was destined to become the most savage prison riot in America's history.